Good afternoon and welcome to our Special Education Leadership Summit, Leading Effective Practices to Support Equitable Outcomes. My name is Paula Schmidt and I am the Director of Patton Pittsburgh. On behalf of the Planning Committee, I am pleased to welcome the just under 500 participants registered for this summit. Um, although many of us are used to participating face-to-face -face at our Summer Leadership Academy and may be missing the chance to collaborate and connect, we are confident that this summit will provide you with guidance, resources, and support as we all continue to navigate these difficult times. I want to thank our Leadership Summit partners, including the Bureau of Special Education, the Council for Administrators of Special Education, and the Pennsylvania Intermediate Unit Association for their collaboration. Because of their commitment to professional development for special education leaders across the Commonwealth, we have put together a very rich and robust agenda. And speaking of partners, one of our favorite partners is Dr. Jenna Scala, Professor of Special Education and Rehabilitation, Department Chair at East Stroudsburg University, and the Research Committee Chair on the Executive Committee of CASE. She will be introducing our esteemed keynoter, who we are thrilled to have kick off our virtual summit for special education leaders. I hope you enjoy the next two days. Jenna? Thanks, Paula. I appreciate it very much. And welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Of course, we'd love to be together, but we will do it so well in our virtual world. It's a pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Sheila Bailey. She's been a friend of mine for many years through CASE. Uh, she is the past president and the current executive director of Virginia CASE, where she works to support 400 members in her organization. She's a former public school special ed teacher and administrator with over 40 years of service to students, teachers, families in diverse communities. Dr. Bailey has performed and prepared current and future educators through courses at many universities. Her focus continues to be educator preparation and support through participation of state and national committees and through her work as an independent educational consultant. At the state level, she represents Virginia Case on the Special Ed and Student Service Advisory Council, Aspiring Special Ed Leaders Academy, and the meetings for new special ed directors. Her national committee work includes service on the Council for Exceptional Children, Leadership Development Committee, and chair of CEC's Council of Administrators of Special Ed, new formed committee on diversification of special education leadership workforce task force. It's a pleasure to have Sheila. You're gonna love her achieving and sustaining equitable outcomes, the role of today's leaders. And I turn it over to you, Sheila. Thank you, Jenna. I am so pleased and happy this morning to be with you. And I really want to thank uh, both Dr. Scala and the members of or persons involved with the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network. Uh, it is such a pleasure to speak with other educators, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about achieving and sustaining. So give me one second to share my screen, if you don't mind. And I'm going to switch over. I tell you, this virtual world is so interesting. And there we are. So let's get started just by talking a little bit about what it means to achieve and sustain equitable outcomes and what it means for the role of today's leader. Well, those of us who have studied and achieved and earned our bachelor's and master's and doctorates, whatever level you find yourself at today, we all have talked to about, listened to the big ideas, the major influencers, um, 
right now there's even a book called Big Ideas in Education, What Every Teacher Should Know with uh, Dr. Russell Grigg. Uh, we've gone through Vygotsky's Thought and Language, Benjamin Bloom and the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, Bruna, the Process of Education. We've heard of Dewey, Gardner, Hilda Tabba, John Goodlad. So there's just a, a full list of those with big ideas and who the major influencers have been in education that have paved the way and led the way. Um, in the civil rights movement, we, as you can see on your screen, uh, we have Dr. King, what just larger than life, major influencer. Um, he has left us with many, many charges as we move forward. Uh, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are we doing or what are you doing for others? And that's key to what I want to talk to you about today is what can I do? What, how do I go forward? I want to talk to you about, take you back a little bit, and this may be before some of you were born. Uh, back to early 1970s, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, my father, who was a really hardworking man, a uh, very devoted family, church man, he decided that it was time for the county to have, the county that I live, we lived in, to have representation from a person of color. So he decided to run for the Board of Supervisors. And if you're familiar with Virginia at all, that the counties have Board of Supervisors and the city has, um, they have, um, you know, the city managers and city council. Well, he just, he made that decision. And the first time he ran, he did not win. And then he said, no, I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna run again. And the second time he ran, he did win. So fast forward, he stayed on that board for 30 years. I think he was only opposed in an election one time. And one of the things that he left us with, and he taught me personally, I was his oldest child, and he embedded in me a desire to make sure that I focused on what I could do. That even if I wasn't going to be a major leader, a major person putting out grand ideas, that there were things that I could do. And I remember when he, at his funeral about six years ago, people came forward and they spoke about things I'd never even heard and I'd been his daughter for many years. And they told personal stories of the time he came to their house and he sat down with them and he talked to them about an issue or he resolved something involving their child or he showed no reluctance whatsoever to go into the home of a person who did not look like himself. And the message that resonated with me through all of that was, no, we may not all be the big thought leaders of today, but we can do things. We can go forth and we can carry a very, very important message. Um, we are hopefully, and I'm being really optimistic, emerging from a period of COVID. We're in a pandemic. And some people would argue and say, Sheila, there is no way you can even think that we're emerging from COVID. We have the Delta variant and we have, we have a situation where um, vaccinations have become politicized and people are not stepping forward to get vaccinated. Uh, we have anger, we have division, we have separation of thought. 
So how in the world do we achieve equitable, how do we sustain equitable outcomes? What's our role? Well, here's what we know. According to the National Education Association, we have achievement gap groups. There's a difference between racial and ethnic minorities. There is a difference between English language learners, and there's a difference between children with disabilities, there's a difference between boys and girls, and there are students, there's a difference with students from low-income families. We know this. This is not a secret to any of us in education. We know that these gaps exist, and the unknown is, I mean, we can assume that um, there will be even more significant gaps with the children coming back to school now. This is post or hopefully post pandemic. The children who are coming back to school, there will be gaps. And that the unknown is how wide is that gap going to be? So that's yet to be seen. All the children are not back yet. They're starting to come back, but we just don't know what we are about to face as educators. One of the interesting uh, pieces that I read when talking about closing the achievement gap has to do with another way of looking at this. It's going to be very different to close the achievement gap without closing the opportunity gap. This is a, right, a really good piece by Kelvin Wellner. And I am going to encourage you to look at that and read that. There are opportunity gaps that exist in the world today. One of them relates to key health issues. Are children equally able to access health care? Having worked in disadvantaged areas, I can tell you from personal experience, that answer is no. Having worked in privileged areas, I know the answer is no. The, there's not equity there. Uh, Identifying the needs of language different children, if they speak languages other than English, identifying their needs, uh, expanding the access to what we would call high quality early childhood education. This is so vital to the success of our children. Providing resources for safe, well-maintained schools. Um, early in my career, I worked, I was the first uh, person hired for emotional disabilities. I'm dating myself now. Uh, first person hired in the county that I worked in when I graduated uh, from Virginia State University. And because I was teaching children with emotional disabilities and they didn't quite know what to expect, then they purchased a little house outside the school. And that's where I was sent with my class and my teacher assistant. We ended up there. So um, there would be days that I would go in and uh, we had a boiler and it wasn't quite work. I learned how to work on a boiler because of that room, that, that house. <laughs> so yeah, um, maintaining adequate resources for, self, for safe uh, schools. Reform testing, there is no secret. We know that testing creates inequities. We know this, but yet we test, test, test. Uh, student discipline, there's a huge move. Uh, last week when we were talking about, we were in our um, leadership conference and we were communicating with our congressional persons up on the hill. We weren't physically there. We were virtually doing that for the second year in a row. And one of the big discussion topics was with us was corporal punishment and 
making sure there was equity in student discipline and um, they were introducing um, language that would prevent just the um, expulsion and um, of children of color and disproportionality in that area. Uh, implement practice and policies that reflect the students' cultural diversity. These are all things that we know we can do. Uh, if you want to start a firestorm nowadays, and this is no secret, you know, uh, start to talk about critical race theory. It, 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 it has become so politicized that there are separate camps and they are very, very, very committed to their way of looking at how we should do things and how we should function as educators. Um, so back to the question, what can I do? What can we do? It, to that story about my dad, he was often asked, you have had major support. No one stays in office that long without great support. And obviously, based on the demographics of our county, uh, he had, um, you know, support in both parties. It was nonpartisan. He had support across the board with uh, majority, minority. So he was often asked, why won't you run for state office or maybe even think about national office? And his answer was always the same thing. I'm motivated to make a difference where I am. I enjoy my space and what I do here and seeing a visible difference. Not to say that everybody should just stay in their one little area, uh, obviously, based on the names I mentioned earlier, it's a great thing to be a big idea, have big ideas, and may be a major influencer. That's a great thing. But we also have to honor and respect those persons who are, for lack of a better way of putting this, the everyday boots on the ground person who is leading who has decided, and look at this quote, I, and I'll confess, I got this off Facebook, but I love it. It's Muna Abdi. It's not inclusion if you invite people into a space that you are unwilling to change. Just having black, white, brown faces in a space that has not undergone any change for the last 20, 30 years, it's not inclusion if it does not address what is going on right now. The other point, anything that disrupts the achievement and the sustaining of equitable outcomes for your students, be anti. And I cannot emphasize that enough. I know people put a lot of, uh, there's a lot of emphasis now on being an anti-racist, a lot of emphasis on um, support for people who are culturally different, who have all types of diversity. And we should, and my work with the diversity task force focuses on attention to people who have been marginalized, bringing more diversity into spaces that has been previously, and not always by design, but sometimes it has happened for other reasons, but bringing diversity into spaces. One of the biggest challenges we, we face with the uh, task force was defining diversity. <laughs> that was a huge challenge. And I think we finally did get to a good definition of what that looks like. But being anti anything that disrupts your ability 
as we move forward to this school year, we have COVID, the Delta variant. We have political unrest. We have people who are very dug in their belief system, either way, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. We have people who are challenging lots of what we do in education. The, we feel like sometimes we're under a microscope. What we have to say is that we are educators, we are committed, and we are ready to serve our students as they come back to us. I wish you nothing but the very best, the very best as you come back to the school year. And I realize when I say come back to the school year, that means anything from July, August, September in Virginia, we have folks starting. I was just saying a few minutes ago, my two granddaughters, elementary age, started school yesterday. My other grandson won't start until September. So I realized starting school used to mean September, early September, doesn't mean that anymore. We have people all over the place. So wherever you find yourself as you start your school year, I wish you nothing but the very, very best. And a final note, thank you for, be, for asking me to be a part of your conference. Uh, I have no doubt that your leaders have planned a wonderful experience for you over the next couple of days. And I wish you the very best. And like was stated earlier, I want to see everybody in person again. I would love to be there and see your faces. But until that time, I wish you nothing but the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, so much. And as we look at our theme, leading effective practices to support equitable outcomes, I just see everything that you said just segue right into that for us to really start um, an exceptional uh, conference. I've been with, uh, Sheila, for many years, and the one thing that I have always learned is she faces a problem, but with a solution. There's never been a problem that uh, I have been involved with her that did not have a solution somewhere with a lot of out-of-the-box thinking, which is why we probably connect so well. So thank you very much. A few quick um announcements. Remember, you're getting a code. Sheila, I'll be in touch with you. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe. There's a uh, session code that I did put in the chat. The session code is A-S-E-O, and you'll see that that's the first letters of the title, Achieving and Sustaining Equitable Outcomes. Please remember that Act 48 credit is being awarded to participants to attend the full afternoon on Monday and or full morning on Tuesday and or the post-conference on Tuesday afternoon. And we'll give you more details as we go about surveys and ways to do that, but please record that. I'm going to turn it over to Paula for any final thoughts or anything that I may have missed. Okay, what an excellent way to start off our summit. We're so excited to have heard from Sheila. Um, so our next session starts in just a few minutes at, at 12.30. So everyone who registered should have gotten links to participate. So please go into your uh, next session, take a little bit of a break and we'll start, start promptly at 12.30. Um, in the chat, I also put the uh, link to all of the handouts. Um, that uh, we were given. So you have access to all of that. So enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. We uh, appreciate your time and your commitment 
um, to serving students uh, of special needs across the Commonwealth. So thank you. Um, and we'll see you at the next session. Bye-bye.